I heard a story recently about a woman who was afraid that a burglar would come into her house and, and rob her and her family. And uh, this fear grew and grew and grew, so much so that uh, she was just full of anxiety and it was really hard for her to sleep at night. And even though her husband assured her and reassured her that her, her worries were unfounded, she just would not listen. Then one night, the husband heard some rustling down uh, on the lower level. He got up to go check it out, and lo and behold, there was a burglar in their house. But he stayed calm, and uh, he, he actually said, uh, good evening. <laughs> uh, we've been waiting for this for a very long time, and in fact, would you mind going upstairs and meeting my wife so that um, um, she's, she's been looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> now, this story is, is, is more of a parable. Uh, it can actually happen, but what we can learn from this is that a burglar will steal from you once, but the fear of a burglar can steal from you for years. And I think in a lot of ways, you and I can all relate to this story. Um, and I, I would just, for full transparency, I'll, I'll tell you, I personally have dealt with anxiety and fears and worries. And I, I want to just ask you in the crowd, uh, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, and even if you just kind of shuffle it up like that, um, how many of you have dealt with anxiety or worry in your life? Um, and how many of you have ever been afraid of, worried about, had anxiety over something that has never actually happened? And if you're home online watching this, every hand has gone up, right? Um, and, and that's the thing. Most of the things that you and I are worried about will never actually take place. But the unfortunate reality is that a, a fearful mind will punish you and enslave you and, and, and bring up all kinds of exaggerations and misconceptions if, if we leave them unchecked. And the goal of today is to put them into check. And, and what I would love for you to do right now is to imagine a life where fear and anxiety no longer enslave you, where they no longer debilitate and control you. I, I want you to imagine for yourself that you have a life full of this still calm peace where it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside everything may, may be chaotic and falling apart but on the inside you have this supernatural calm and I know right now for some of you you're thinking that's impossible you might be thinking to yourself there's no way knowing what's going on in your life that you could ever have that and yet I'm here today to tell you that no. Nope, that is exactly what God our Father has in store for every one of us, that he is offering us today, is that peace, that still calm, calmness in our lives. And, and what we're going to see is that this is the same peace that the Apostle Paul had, that he experienced firsthand, that he shared with the Philippian church. And, and we're going to read that shortly. But before we do, I, I really want you to understand something about the Apostle Paul. His life on the outside, what we le read in scriptures, it, it was super chaotic. It, it was really messy. Uh, many of the things that you and I worry that might possibly happen to us actually happened to him. That was his reality. If you've ever worried that someone might persecute you for your faith in Jesus, uh, you were worried that they might make fun of you, call you names, maybe get you in trouble with your boss or, or get you fired. All these things happened to the Apostle Paul. That was his reality and, and things that were much, much worse than that. In the book of Acts, we learn about his different missionary journeys. And the first time that he went to Philippi, Greece, he was preaching the gospel in the streets and he was literally beaten with rods and then he was thrown into prison. And then we're told that he went on to Thessalonica where mobs gathered around him and kicked him out of the city. Then he went on to Berea and the same thing happened there. And there were times when Paul was legitimately afraid for his life because he had almost lost it multiple times. And while he was in Corinth, that fear almost caused him to pre quit preaching for good. Because everything that was happening on the outside, all that chaos, was now starting to erode his inner peace. And that's when Jesus came to him, appeared to him in a vision. In Acts chapter 18, it says this. Jesus said to Paul, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. Even the Apostle Paul dealt with fear. 
Even he felt like giving up. And, and this word from the Lord was, was right when he needed it to encourage him to keep on keeping on. And, and you and I can relate to Paul in this way that, that so often when, when bad things keep happening over and over again, eventually we just want to give up. We just want to quit. And, and that fear and that anxiety that comes with all that can paralyze us and keep us from doing what God has called us to do. And the reason I'm sharing Paul's backstory with you today is because in Philippians chapter 4, he's going to give us some tips and instructions on how to deal with our anxiety and our worries. But if you didn't know his backstory, it'd be very easy for you to say, you know what, Paul, who do you think you are? You have no idea what's going on in my life. You have no idea what the anxieties that I'm dealing with. You, you have no idea the pressures that I have in my, my home, in, in my job. You don't know how people are treating me. You just don't know Paul. And I'm saying this is because when I first read these instructions many, many years ago, those were my initial thoughts. Like, Paul, you just don't get it. But when I realized that he did, when I learned that, no, he knew exactly what I was going through and even experienced much worse, it actually gave me hope. Because it made me realize that if, if Paul could have peace in the midst of his chaos, then I can too. And that's why I'm excited to share this message with you guys today is because I am confident that the same peace that Paul had and the same peace that he preached can be yours. And so with, let's just get right into it. And Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 4, first verses 4 and 5. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So when your life is falling apart, everything is, is blowing up, it's super chaotic, first thing that Paul says to you is, read it with me, he says what? Rejoice! Woohoo! <laughs> right? Life is good, even when it's not, he says. And keep in mind, he's writing this while he's a prisoner in Rome, Italy. Okay? Um, he's not sitting on a beach somewhere, sipping on a Corona with a lime in it. This is not a good situation that Paul's in. Uh, you and I have the freedom to get up and go wherever we want. He did not have that in that moment. And yet, this preacher says to you and me, he declares, he commands us, he says, rejoice. And, and I love the fact that, like a good preacher, he, he repeats himself. He says, I'll say it again. Rejoice. Because he wanted to make sure that you and I would understand this very important truth. Now, the key to this command is not just to rejoice for the sake of rejoicing, but notice what he says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then at the end, he says, the Lord is near. So the Lord he's talking about is Jesus Christ. And in order to fight back against the, the worries and anxieties that you and I experience, to fight back against the negative self-talk we, we tell ourselves when we're stressing out, to fight back against the what-ifs and the worst-case scenarios that, that we come up with in our minds, Paul tells us we need to stop and intentionally rejoice and Jesus, our Lord. And the way to do that is to remind ourselves of, of who he is and what he has done. And after Jesus died on the cross, after he rose from the dead, and right before he ascended into heaven, this is what he declared to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what does that mean? It means that no matter what's going on on the outside of you, or even on the inside, Jesus is still in control. He is the supreme authority. Not your parents, not your spouse, not your boss, not your doctors, not our mayor, not our governor, not the president, but Jesus. Because he literally went to hell and back declaring his victory over all sin, over death, over the power of the devil, Jesus Christ has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And the Apostle Paul thought about that. He meditated on that. He rejoiced over that time and time again. And you see this embedded all throughout his letters, specifically in the book of Romans. Check out these verses. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings, what we're going through right now, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So 
he gets punched in the face and he says, you know what? <laughs> this is fine <laughs> because I get to be with Jesus forever in heaven. It's going to be awesome. So I'm not even going to compare the two. This is going to be great. Here's another one. Many of you have heard this. This was my wedding verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So when everything is going badly for Paul, what does he do? He rejoices in the Lord and he immediately tells himself, but he's going to work this for good. He's going to work this for good. I know it because that's what he's declared. And then he goes on further. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. How is he convinced? Because he's thinking about this. He's experiencing it. He reminds himself, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So even when he is faced with the prospect of dying, Paul tells himself the truth that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate him from the love of God that he finds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what I want you to notice and understand is that Paul doesn't just instruct us to do these things. He is practicing them. He's living them out. He's being a, an example for us. And he shows us that the key to having peace here on the inside is to remember that the Lord is near. I'm going to repeat that. The ability to have peace in here is to understand that the Lord is near. And he's probably much nearer than you might realize. If you've been baptized, if you've had water poured over your head in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the promise is this, is that God's Spirit, the Spirit of our Lord Jesus, now lives inside of you. And you take him with you wherever you go. Doesn't matter if you're in an airplane, you're in a submarine, you're in a coffee shop. Wherever you go, there the Lord is with you. He is near you. He knows exactly what's going on and he is in control. And listen, if you've never received that gift of baptism, please talk with me after the service. I'd love to tell you more about it. I'd love for you to receive that gift because it is such a comfort to know that the Lord is near. And also, the other promise is that Jesus bodily is in heaven sitting at the right hand of God the Father and he promises that one day, sooner than later, he's going to come back and so um, we know that he is near in proximity and also time-wise and the nearness, and that nearness he promises that he's going to eradicate all sin and undo all the chaos that you and I are, are currently experiencing. So do me a favor, let's read this whole thing together, Okay. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Now keep this in mind. Joy isn't just a feeling. It is a personal choice to react to life circumstances with faith. And, and in order to rejoice, you have to have joy. But again, your joy, your rejoicing is not based on your outward circumstances. It's based on who our God is. It's based on what he's done for us. And it's based on what he's promised to do for us. One other thing I want to point out real quickly in this section is where Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. When the world is chaotic, when, when, you're, when you're tired, when you're stressed out, when you're anxious, do you tend to be gentle with those around you? I don't. <laughs> and, and, and what's interesting is that often, especially if you've been in the faith for a long time, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you've matured in your faith, um, do you find yourself being gentle with those that don't know as much as you? That you, you tell yourself, man, shouldn't you know this by now? And, and we kind of get a little crusty. <laughs> and, 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 and Paul's reminding us, don't forget where you were. Don't forget about all the questions that you had as you were growing up in your faith. Don't, don't forget how patient and gentle others were with you when you were dealing with your moral failings. So it, it's important that we let our gentleness that flows from the joy of Jesus to be evident to all. And, and now Paul gives us this advice. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Now in this, he's not saying you shouldn't have 
cares and concerns about other people, but he says don't be anxious, and I'm going to describe what that means in a minute. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So it's his, another command. First of all, he says rejoice. Now he says do not be anxious about anything. And what's interesting is the, the Greek word for anxious means to be pulled apart in different directions. You ever feel that way when you're anxious? Being pulled apart? Um, it means that you have a divided mind, and when you have a divided mind, you don't know what to do. You feel stuck. You feel paralyzed. You're like, where do I go? Um, our English word anxious actually comes from the Latin word, which literally means to choke. You ever feel that way when, when you're anxious? You feel like you're being choked? You can't breathe? Your chest caves in on you? <gasps> it's hard to breathe. Right? So what these words are helping us understand is that, that when you're dealing with anxiety, it is a mental, but it's also a, a physical thing. And, and there are, are, are bad ramifications. And if you've ever gone through um, deep, dark anxiety, uh, you, you immediately go into survival mode. Your, your instincts kick in, and you want to get rid of those thoughts and those feelings as quickly as possible. And, and there are a lot of ways that you and I deal with anxiety. Smoking cigarettes, vaping, uh, chewing tobacco, drinking alcoholic or caffeinated drinks, uh, eating food or, or treats to get us to calm down. Uh, some, some of us use prescription or illegal drugs. Uh, sometimes we have excessive time on the screen, whether it's binge-watching movies or, or just scrolling through our phone. And I presume we've tried at least one or, or many or maybe all of these. And here's the thing. To some degree, they work. Uh, to some degree, they, they distract us from what we're worried about. The chemicals that we put in our bodies, um, they have the ability to, to calm us. They have this calming effect. But all of them, whether it's written on the carton or the box or the can, have negative side effects. All right? Some can cause lung cancer and liver disease. Some could cause you to lose control of your mental capacities, causing you harm or other people harm. Uh, some literally say they can increase anxiety and suicidal thoughts the exact thing we're trying to run away from. And, and what I'm getting at is that these man-made solutions, none of them, can give us the long-lasting peace that we desire without eventually hurting us. And that's why Paul here, you notice that none of those make his list. None of those are, are on his instructions. But instead, what he presents to us are tried and true methods that consistently gave him supernatural peace. The peace that he says transcends all understanding that has the ability to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The peace that stops all those racing thoughts and the shortness of breath. And so how do you get that peace? He says, don't be anxious about anything. Wouldn't that be sad if you just left it there? You're like, ah, <laughs> now what? But he doesn't. He goes on. He says, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So what Paul tells us here is that the, the solution to our anxiety and our worries is simply and yet powerfully prayer. It's to say in your heart, or better yet, to say out loud with your mouth, God, I can't. I can't handle this situation. I can't do this thing. I feel overwhelmed. And you simply say, help me. It's you inviting God into your situation. And here's the thing. It's very, it's very important. And it's good that you're specific. Just recently I was talking with a soccer mom. Uh, she's caring for her elderly mother who is now in a, uh, a nursing home. And so they had to sell off her condo and and get rid of a lot of her belongings. And she knew that that might be a situation where it would cause great anxiety for her mother. And so she's telling me on the sidelines, she's like, yeah, I normally don't do this, but I was, very, I was praying very specifically that day for very specific things. And, and, and it turned out great. But what surprised me is that she said, I normally don't do that. Right? She's normally not specific. And yet, it's okay to be specific. Um, because 
God wants you to be. He wants to hear what's specifically going on in your life right now. When you go to a restaurant and uh, you don't have a general food request, right? It's like, just food. <laughs> no, they hand you a menu and you look at it and you give a, a very specific order to the waiter and, and the waiter, uh, if, if they know that the food is there, they'll, they'll kindly go get it for you. But here's the cool thing. God is not your waiter. He's your heavenly father. And he says, come to me, all you who are burdened, Cast all your anxiety on me because I care for you. Well, what is specifically burdening you at this moment? Tell God, and he wants to help you. And understand this. God is not too busy for you. I'll repeat that. God is not too busy for you. Get that out of your head, okay? How many of you have ever said, well, I just don't want to bother God? That is stupid. <laughs> Okay? It's stupid. You're not bothering God. God is so big, so strong. And, and don't ever think that, well, I don't want to ask him for this because he can't do that. What? What are you thinking? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and, and he wanted to create light, you know what he did? He said, let there be light. And you know what happened? It popped up. It was there. Okay? Our God can do everything and anything. Do not limit him. Don't minimize what he can do. When, when the Israelites found themselves stuck, literally, between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army, they could not get out. There was no way out. What did God do? He created a way out. He divided that Red Sea so they could walk through it. When Daniel found himself in the lion's den with a bunch of hungry lions, no way out. He couldn't climb those walls. What did God do? He sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. When Peter was in the middle of a lake, drowning, what did Jesus do? He grabbed his hand and he saved him. When Thomas could not for the life of him believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, he was swimming in his doubts. What did Jesus do? He showed up and he showed himself and he said, believe. This is what our Father is capable of doing. And so when you're filled with anxious thoughts, quiet yourself. Give yourself the space to just breathe. And he says, pray with thanksgiving in your hearts and confidently ask him, help me, and he will. And, and he's going to replace that anxiety with what? Peace. I know many of you have heard this, this verse before, but I don't know if you knew that it was in the context of prayer. He says, don't be anxious pray, and this is what you get, and he says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, meaning, I don't get it, but I got it. <laughs> Feels good. How to get there? It's, it's a Jesus thing, right? Transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And if you're skeptical right now, if you're thinking, no way, pray, are you kidding me? Sounds too easy. This is my encouragement to you. Just try it. If I were your doctor right now and I wrote out a, wrote out a prescription and handed it to you, would you not go and f fulfill that prescription and take that medication? Absolutely. So I'm asking you, try it. And, and understand, with medication, is there always an immediate effect? Not always. Sometimes it takes time for it to kick in, right? Same thing with prayer. Sometimes you can have an immediate effect and it's, it's good to go. Otherwise, sometimes God says, all right, cool. I'm glad you're praying. Just hold on. But if you don't get an immediate response, do not give up on prayer. Do not give up on it. Keep on, keep on, keep on praying to your Heavenly Father who loves you, who loves to give you good gifts, who loves to give you peace. Make it your priority to pray to your Heavenly Father when everything outside of you is chaotic so that you can have peace on the inside. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Always. No matter what. And remember, Paul knows what you're going through, right? So you can't play that card anymore like, Paul, you don't know. No, always. Pray to the Lord without ceasing. And then he, he ends with these final instructions. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I'm just impressed by how many adjectives he came up with to be able to describe all those things, right? So he says, think about all these things. And he goes on. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul here is emphasizing what you and I think about. He says it matters. So get this. If, if you let yourself constantly think about negative things, what are you probably going to be? Negative. Right? If, if you let your mind wander and, and ponder all the what if, worst case scenarios of what might happen to you or your loved ones, I have no doubt you're going to be filled with anxiety. But if you think about what is true, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, then you will have peace. Godly peace. So what are those true and noble thoughts? We talked about quite a few of them today. God loves you. And he loves to answer your prayers. The Spirit of our Lord is near you because you've received the gift of baptism. The troubles you're facing right now are not worth comparing to the glory that you're going to receive when you enter into heaven. It's absolutely true that God's going to use whatever is happening in your life for good. And nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of your Savior, Jesus. Think about such things. And as Paul says here, read it with me, put it into practice. They say practice makes, which is a lie. (laughs) But practice makes habits, right? When you're stressed, you're anxious, and you've made it your practice to dwell on the negative or to run to remedies with negative side effects, you've created a habit. And habits are hard to break. But they're not impossible to break. And this is where you turn again to your Heavenly Father and you say, look, I've been trying all these other methods. I've used this entire list. It doesn't help me at all. I need you to break that habit. And he will. And ask him to make it your habit that when when life is hard, say, help me to automatically pray to you. Help that be my knee-jerk reaction, that in this moment I need to talk to my Savior. And it doesn't matter if it's a seemingly little thing or if it's massively big. Whatever it is, big or small, bring it to your Father. Ask him. Specifically, say, train my thoughts so that everything that, I, that happens to me, I can say, this is going to be for my good because you've promised me. That's what Paul did to get that inner peace. And learning from his example, that's what a little girl named Claire did as well. Uh, many years ago, I was a student pastor, and uh, part of my duties was to make sure all the lights were off and that the doors were locked for church afterwards. And I, I walked into the sanctuary area, and sitting in the back pew was little eight-year-old Claire, scared me half to death because I didn't expect her to be in there. And I see her looking up at the cross. I said, Claire, what are you doing? And this little eight-year-old girl said, I'm just thinking about everything that Jesus did for me. And what she taught me in that moment is that these principles that Paul laid out for us, they don't have an age limit. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are that when you put these things into practice, when you rejoice always in the Lord, when you pray continually, and when you fix your thoughts on him, I don't care who you are, you will have the peace that transcends all understanding that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we all struggle with anxiety or worry. Uh, and part of that is we're, we're still growing in our faith. And sometimes we lack that. Uh, sometimes it's just experience. Life is hard. And when it happens over and over again, it's, our body just goes into 
preservation mode. But today, Lord, thank you so much for these words in Philippians chapter 4 that remind us that we have this amazing tool called prayer that we so underutilize, but yet we're reminded that we get to come to you no matter what and cast all of our cares on you because you care for us. Lord, take our thoughts and make them yours. In your name we pray.